Uh, welcome back, everyone, to Forward Cloud Sec. Uh, can I actually have somebody there close the door between the rooms? That way we can uh, avoid creating too much disturbance. Thank you. Um, so before we begin, uh, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Jupiter One. Uh, Jupiter One specializes in cyber asset visibility and management, connecting the dots between assets, people, and risk across your technology stack. With one centralized view of assets, security teams can answer complex questions, make data-driven decisions, and stay secure. With that, I'd like you to welcome Matt Keough, who's here to talk about passing the security burden, how to see the unforeseen. Thank you, Matt. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. And thank you so much for being here and for having me. Uh, and yep, here we go. We're going to talk about passing the security button, how to see the unforeseen. So just a quick introduction before we start. Um, obviously, my name is Matt. Um, I'm a cloud security architect at Lloyd's Banking Group currently. Uh, up until very, very recently, I uh, was a security consultant at WiffSecure. Um, I've been in the IT industry now for around eight years. Um, I started off on the support desk, uh, worked my way up to a sysops, and this is when I first saw AWS, and I kind of fell in love with it from there. Um, at the moment, I'm actually kind of transitioning towards Azure and GCP, but honestly, anything that's cloudy is kind of cool, but I'll always love AWS because it was my, you know, first cloud provider. Okay, so what are we going to look at today? So first off, we're going to have a look at um, workspaces um, and just see how this service kind of um, incorporates this, this issue, if that makes sense. Um, but it's in a, an AWS control VPC where it's not as much of an issue. Um, we'll then proceed to have a look at DRS. Um, and this is how it passes the security burden onto the customer here. And finally, uh, we'll just have a quick review of a, a process um, and how you can kind of spot these things in the future in your own AWS accounts. OK, so AWS Workspaces, for those that have never heard of the service before, it's effectively just think Citrix, kind of VDI, desktops in the cloud, but it's all owned by, by AWS. Now, if we were typically doing a sort of service review on this service, we'd be looking at um, uh, things like networking, so for example, where is the service communicating to and from? Um, things like encryption and storage, what's it storing about uh, maybe uh, the users that are using it, or what kind of encryption levels is it using? Also, what permissions would be required? So if I was first using this service in my AWS account, I'd want to know what do I need to enable? Um, you know, what kind of IAM roles do I need to incorporate to be able to use the service effectively? And also, do I actually have any organization requirements? So for example, have I got certain classifications of data um, that I wouldn't want being stored on, on workspaces, for example? But finally, um, what about other services that Workspaces actually incorporates as part of its offering? So if we have a quick look at the network diagram um, of Workspaces, so this is the sort of architectural setup, straight away we can notice that there's three AWS VPCs that are in the mix. Now, we're not going to focus on the two that are on the right-hand side in this case. We're just going to focus on the one that's on the left. Um, and for anyone that's used um, AWS or is, or is familiar with AWS services, if, if I said to you that there's some kind of compute power behind an AWS service offering, we can probably assume that it's either going to be EC2 or some kind of ECS container-based instance. Now, the thing that's important with the Workspaces service specifically is this is all within an AWS VPC. So you, as a customer, can only control access to that, that compute resource through something that the Workspace service offers you. So if you were looking to restrict a specific sort of API permission, you could only go through Workspaces. But let's say you want to stick a security group on that specific EC2, then that's purely now in control of AWS, and it's their responsibility to keep that EC2 secure, in other words. OK, but what about DRS? So if you've not heard of DRS before, it um, stands for Elastic Disaster Recovery Service. And what this service basically does is acts as a single point backup um, solution that you can effectively install on any kind of compute or server-based instance, whether this be in another cloud provider, on-premise, or even your own laptop, for example. So how it would work is you install the agent. This then copies data up to AWS. And as we all know, things do go wrong, and at some point, I'm sure they will, uh, at which point you can just hit a button in the DRS console or issue an API command, at which point anything that DRS has backed up will now be respawned onto a, an EC2 agent within AWS. So that's good. OK, so we're just going to quickly walk through the DRS install process and kind of how, um, how we'd get it set up in the first place. So it effectively 
because it's an agent, we obviously have to install something. And the way that AWS handle this is we grab something from an S3 bucket and we run a script effectively. From here, it'll ask for a set of access keys. So we provide it that. And now it'll um, basically check whatever disks uh, it's found on the server or on the laptop or whatever it may be. Um, you can select kind of specific disks that you want to replicate, but for this example, we'll replicate the whole server. So in this case, it's just a 20 gig uh, disk that we're replicating. And after quite some time, everything will get installed and it'll start replicating up to the server, uh, to DRS, sorry. Um, this will take quite a bit of time because I assume that AWS do throttle this line so that not you know every customer in the world is instantly sending hundreds of gigs down this network. So it does take quite some time, but eventually um, it will appear in the DRS console. So now that our server's in the DRS console, um, we can see here on the left, um, it's ready. Um, you know, the backup is fully completed. It does take quite some time, but in the event of something going horribly wrong now with, with the actual server in the first place, we can hit initiate recovery job. And what this will do is just spawn the server onto an EC2. So, you know, you could, for example, um, if you had an Ubuntu VM or something, you copy it up with DRS, hit initiate recovery job, and that server will now be spawned on, onto an EC2 exactly as it originally was. And because of that, we can now all sleep much safer at night because everything's backed up and DRS has our backsides covered in the event that anything goes horribly wrong. Okay, but now let's have a look at how DRS actually works. So as we kind of talked about before, we know that there's, um, it's copying uh, a disk up from, say, on-prem or from another server into AWS. And the way that it does this is it has a replication server which sits in the middle. And the important thing about this is it's living in your VPC. It's not in AWS's VPC. So this is just an EC2 agent, uh, EC2 server, sorry, um, that AWS spawn for you automatically as soon as you start using DRS. It then proceeds to attach EBS volumes to it. Now, these EBS volumes effectively have a one-to-one -one relationship from whatever you originally copied from on-prem or from another cloud provider, wherever DRS was copying its data from. So in our case, our 20 gigabyte disk that we originally started copying up will now have a 20 gigabyte EBS volume within um, AWS and very specifically within our AWS account. So this will just act like an, a normal EBS volume um, or the EC2 server will just act like a normal EC2 that's within our AWS account. Okay, so now that we've started the backup, we can see on screen, this is a, a screenshot from the actual replication server. So I'm sure anyone that's seen AWS before will know that the eight gigabyte volume that's attached here is the, is the root uh, OS drive. And then we also have the 20 gigabyte um, data volume that we had. Um, backed up from our original server from on-prem or from the other cloud provider. Now, where this starts to become an issue is the permissions that are being shared between the two services have now kind of overlapped with each other. So if I wanted to, for example, block somebody doing something at the DRS level, I now need to consider how I block them at the EC2 level as well. Because if I, for example, want to stop someone viewing data that um, DRS has originally backed up, I no longer just need to block them at the DRS level, I also need to block them at the EC2 level. So the permissions are getting a little bit mixed up here, um, because specifically because this is being deployed into your AWS account and not a provider controlled one. So let's start walking through the risks that we've seen here as well. So once we've copied up our server, let's say that for whatever reason, this server has been migrated into AWS and we can now use something like AWS backup. We no longer need to rely on DRS uh, to provide our backup. So let's say we want to remove it effectively from AWS. So first off, we'll hit the disconnect from AWS. So what this will do is this will stop the agent that's um, on the original server from sending any new data from AWS. So the, effectively it will stop replicating any changes. And just for good measure, we'll actually delete the server from DRS as well. So now there is no possibility, at least from the DRS console, um, to replicate this server onto an EC2 instance. However, what DRS actually does here as part of its initial process, so on the first architecture diagram that we'll be looking at, we kind of touch base on the EBS volume, so it creates an EBS volume and also a snapshot based on that volume. And depending on what side of the equation you're on here, if you're on the operational side or the security side, you're going to probably have different opinions on this. But 
at least from the security side, these EBSs and these snapshots are not removed from AWS once you delete everything from DRS. So from this point, at least from the DRS side of things, there is no way to replicate or reboot the server onto another EC2. But it leaves the EBS snap, uh, and the snapshot just hanging around. So again, from a security perspective, if I was looking at this, I now need to potentially ensure that somehow people are going to go in and actually clean up their stuff or create some brand new automated process that is going to clean this up for me. OK, so we also touched base a little bit on the replication server that DRS uh, spins up. And this is a screenshot from the user data um, of that replication server. And we can see um, that effectively what AWS are doing are removing SSM and also disabling SSH, which is on first glance great, because why would you want anybody accessing this replication server? But I'm sure anyone that's used um, AWS and has specifically been tinkering around with user data before will know that you can effectively force it to run again um, by effectively creating a schedule on it. So I've included a link if anyone wants to see how that's done. But a short TLDR of this is effectively we can cause this user data to run again. So in this case, I've just put a simple reverse shell in there. Um, I'll reboot the server. And all of a sudden, I will now have access to the actual replication server. But why is this bad? Well. Now that we've actually got access to the server, anything, any of those EBS volumes that are still attached to this server, we can now just simply mount um, and gain access to any of the data. So again, referring back to that permissions mix up earlier, anyone that can reboot uh, an EC2 instance and change the user data can now prevent, uh, potentially um, access any of the data that uh, DRS has originally backed up. So, Looking at the screenshot there, probably looks quite familiar as the root OS drive, um, and that's because it is. And it's important to note that DRS never detaches these volumes from the actual replication server as long as it's still syncing with AWS, because this is how it ensures that they're both being uh, synced effectively. And uh, obviously, for those that are slightly eagle-eyed in here, uh, you may be asking, why does the replication server has a, have a user called Matthew on it? That's a bit strange. Um, that's just because I set up SSH, because you know doing things through reverse shells just kind of sucks. So. But also, something else that I was able to do with, with DRS was effectively cause it to um, break. Um, and again, this is primarily because this is being deployed into my VPC rather than AWS's. So we've kind of touched base on how DRS actually works with the two replications with the replication server, sorry. Um, and the way that I was able to at least force it to break was to initiate a backup on, and then this will instantly create an EBS on the original replication server um, and start copying data to it. Now, while this backup was in progress, I shut down the original uh, replication server. It proceeded to, it be sorry, being AWS, um, instantly spun up a new replication server to continue the backup process. Um, and then as soon as I rebooted my original server, it just seemed to get completely stuck. And the backup was unrecoverable from. Um, it, you just, it would never fix itself, no matter if I shut down the original two, started up the new one again, it was just completely stuck. Um, and DRS kind of has no automatic way of alerting that a backup isn't, isn't working correctly. So again, if someone has enough permissions to mess around with EC2 in your account, they could effectively cause the DRS backup process to just never work, um, which from a, again, security perspective, not very great. OK, so let's just summarize the risks that we've, we've um, gone through. So first off, we've got EBS volumes that are being used in the account. Again, if someone's got access to the EC2 service within that account, not great, because they can access this. We also saw that EBS volumes weren't being deleted and the snapshots. So once we removed everything from DRS, there's another process that someone has to go through, again, on the EC2 side. Um, we were also able to gain access to the replication server as well, effectively. Again, if someone has access to EC2, they now have access to all the data that DRS has ever backed up. We were also able to disrupt the service and to effectively cause it to stop backing up. Um, again, not great if you want to ensure that your backups are you know, being synced up every time. And there was no way to actually alert to this as well. And also, the, the service permissions that are being used by both DRS and EC2 are now kind of a bit mixed up. Um, so it's not really clear from a 
preventative or you want to get good governance on the IAM side, um, of which you need to be blocking and which you don't, because it's the DRS service, although on, on the front you'd expect it to just be using one set, it's very heavily reliant on the EC2 side of things. And because we were kind of doing a service review here, there is always, of course, going to be the other stuff, um, like networking, encryption, et cetera, but that's not the main focus of today. So just raising them for awareness, but that's not what we're primarily looking at. Now, in my opinion, all these risks that have just turned red would be completely removed or mitigated to a significant factor that I'd be okay with if DRS was deploying stuff in an AWS control VPC rather than putting things on the onus of me as the customer. But having said that, this isn't actually a witch hunt or a finger pointing exercise at AWS. So data classification and a lot of the regulatory uh, compliance around backups is so red tapey and stringent that I don't actually blame AWS for making the decisions that they've made to put it in, in, the, co in the customer's um, VPC, but it's important to understand these risks and this is the whole point of this talk, to be to ensure that you're aware of them and that you know how to spot them. Um, and I think, as one of the talks said earlier, you know, if a cloud provider is doing something, um, it is kind of your responsibility to secure that if you're going to use the service. Obviously, we can always promote them making kind of better choices, but we have what we have. And the point of this talk is to alert you to that fact. And just to note as well, AWS isn't the only um, cloud provider that do, does this. I don't know if anyone's uh, seen Cloud Composer in, in GCP, um, but that effectively spins up a managed Kubernetes cluster within your VPC, which as soon as it, although the GCP actually look after the cluster, so to speak, it does have a network address, you know, which anyone that's in your VPC already can, can instantly reach and start messing with. So it's not just AWS. But on that note, so just sticking uh, back on purely on, on AWS as well, it's not just the DRS service that does it. Um, you know, a lot of AWS services do make use of other services in some way, shape, or form. Um, it's important to note the distinction between whether it's being deployed in a customer VPC or an AWS VPC, because at this point, this changes the risk and whose responsibility it is. So DRS was just an example of where it would be the customer's uh, job to kind of mitigate the risks. Um, to give another example as well, S3 would be quite a common one. So um, just to give a bare bones example, if you think CloudTrail, if anyone's ever created one through the console before, it automatically creates the S3 bucket for you. Now, did you look at the actual bucket policy that it created? Did you look at the bucket ACLs? Like, although they may be secure, you know, from an, like we know that AWS will make them secure to some degree. Are they acceptable for your organization? Are they secure for you? You still need to check all the time Anything that spins up another service, um, give it a good prod. And just a final note that th like these risks can still be present in AWS VPCs, but if, if, the, if the service or the product is deployed within an AWS VPC, it's their responsibility to fix uh, or to secure, so to speak, um, and not yours. Okay, so defining a process, how did I spot this and what would be my recommendation for kind of spotting these kind of things in the future? So when you start using a new service, always read the provider docs, you know, they're always great, especially look for network architecture diagrams if they're available, because the amount of things that you can just spot straight away by looking at those is always great. But at the same time, if you've gone to all that effort of actually creating those documents, build some internal pages and an internal wiki page, because actually when you start to put pen to, uh, pen to paper, so to speak, you'll actually notice a bunch more stuff while you're doing that. Always keep the organization in mind. So just because a service is okay for one person or one organization doesn't necessarily mean it's okay for another. So just always keep your organization and what level of risk you're acceptable with in mind. Um, but also boot up the service and actually have a play, have a prod. So I'd never, for example, if I was doing a review of a new service, I'd never just trust what the documentation is saying. You know, this is how we find zero days and the like. So always boot stuff up, have a prod, have a play, make sure you understand end to end how the service works and what it does. And most importantly, always keep service dependency in mind. So if a service happens to be using parts of another service, just always make sure you've tested that other service end to end as well. So exactly like we saw with DRS, you know, as soon as I noticed it was using um, EC2, make sure you prod that EC2 component that it's relying on just as much as you're prodding the original service. And with that, thank you so much for listening and I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, <clears throat> 
Thank you very much. Um, uh, if anyone has questions, uh, please raise your hand. Um, or if you're in the back, feel free to use Slack. And if you're in the front, I'll uh, try to get to the microphone so that those on the live stream can hear us. Um, so I guess my sort of first question is, have you shared some of this feedback with Amazon around ability to muck with the service, the fact that they're kind of leaving data around, and like, what was their response to that? Uh, yeah, we did actually. So I actually had a really good response of Amazon. They were kind of asking, is there anything that we can do to kind of make this better? Um, I have provided my feedback to them and obviously we did have a long discussion about how um, regulation and compliance can get in the way of backup services quite heavily. Um, but yeah, as a TLDR, spoke to them, had really good feedback. Um, but yeah, they're aware of this at least. Yeah. Um and I would say, like, sort of, are there things you would want more from them? So, for example, you talk about saying, hey, you're trying to make sure that we're all aware of this, and I think that's great. Um, but naively, I would sort of want Amazon to be calling this out and sort of putting this in the big red flashing blink tag saying, be aware of these things. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, in an ideal world, I think, you know, Amazon could be a bit more um, sort of potent about this. And I think, at least personally, there's not currently really a good way to use DRS if you are using EC2 in your AWS account. So, which if you want to start using uh, DRS, it kind of needs its own separate AWS account. So, yeah, documentation could be a little bit clearer on that. Um and then have you thought about like other ways that you could use this to like exploit or steal data? For example, snapshotting EBS volumes, making them public. Uh, yeah, so I think that's that's one of the main points of this talk, right? That like as soon as a service starts to rely heavily on another service, all the risks that are present in EC2, for example, now apply to DRS. So as soon as it creates a, a snapshot, for example, yeah, the risk is there that it could be made public as well. Um, any other questions? Yeah, one sec. I'm, I noticed that one of your recommendations was documentation and keeping a wiki. And you know, while we should probably all be very awkward and on trend and say, of course, the AI will write the docs for you, um, and of course, also keep them up to date. Uh, I was curious if you'd, uh, uh, and apologies if I missed it earlier, recommend places where we are keeping any of this knowledge in machine-readable form. It's almost impossible to get just the list of services and the price tags they have, be able to simulate your own calculators on how much these services cost. But what these services are built out of in turn and internally, um, I've not yet come across anything that's trying to be like a knowledge graph at that level of detail. Do you think one exists or should one exist? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so obviously public documentation can be a bit uh, surprised, but I'm just going to shout out with secure secwiki.cloud. Um, we do have a DRS page um, and all these kind of things are in here. Um, but yeah, effectively, I'm not really sure of any other public services, um, but yeah, they would be great if they existed. So I only have to attack yours. Uh, yeah, effectively. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, any other questions? All right, uh, can we give one more round of applause for Matt? Thank you very much.